As well as Lynn was saying, I'm the men's pastor at Overcomer Covenant Church, and you know, my family, we did some things uh, in Moses Lake, you know, we planted a, a church, and we had a Christian school, and it was a phenomenal assignment, and, and then we, you know, through transition, you know, we thought we would die in Moses Lake, and we, here's something I said, I said, I would never live on the west side or western Washington where it's raining all the time. Yeah, worst thing you could ever say is never. So the Lord went, oh, that's cute. I need you to move now to Western Washington. And so in that transition, though, because we were senior pastors in Moses Lake, and, and so it's been difficult to try to navigate and figure out what the next assignment really looked like. You know, I enjoy preaching the Word. I enjoy ministering to families, whether it be young ones, old ones. It just really doesn't matter. And I found myself involved in the men's ministry, and it's... It's actually become a really solid passion of mine. Because I believe when you get the heart of a man, you'll get the heart of the home. And when you get the heart of the home, you get the church, then you get the community, and then you get the nations. I believe it starts with the man. And so I want to give you guys, if our, our team would go ahead and show this video, I want to show you a video this morning of just a few guys that have gone through the event. What kind of man was I before the return? much less of a man. I was angry, um, angry and frustrated at the church and with where I was in life. Was uh, someone who'd been hiding from himself for a long time and been hiding from God. Let's just say this way, I did life on my own. When I was at church, I would just go to church and go home. I was on the outskirts. I used to be a perimeter guy. <laughs> I'd sit back in the third row, the third or the last row and as soon as church is done, I'm out of there. And now, <laughs> two years later, I like feels like I'm one of the last guys to leave. There were men who went with me to the return that I didn't know, and I have lifelong friends uh, with an intimate brotherhood that most men think they don't need and have been longing for their entire life. They're my brothers. Uh, walked in there, strangers walked out with 11 brothers. It wasn't until I came to the return Northwest that I actually understood who I was as a son of the king. And at that point, I was able to start operating in the giftings that he's placed in my heart. Oh yeah, I didn't want to go. I, I had to ask Bob his name four times from the time he got my luggage out of the car, just carrying it inside the church, four times. Someone that's hesitant to come to the return I would say trust the process. I would say believe that God is able to do a lot more than your current state. You will experience something at this event that will change you forever. And God will continue to use that experience in your life to radically shift you and your family. For the first time in my life, I received the Father's forgiveness and felt what that was like. To feel forgiven was indescribable. I'll never be the same. I'm more intentional now with being a little bit less angry, a lot more understanding, and a heck of a lot more loving with my wife as well as with my kids. But to me, if, if you're already on that boundary of taking the steps and you have those little slight thoughts of maybe not, maybe not, quiet those fears, quit thinking, do it. If you're really looking for a change, do it. This is not a retreat, this is an encounter. And all I can say about it is you don't go home disappointed. You go home changed. My name is Jeff Wallace and I'm the men's pastor at Overcomer Covenant Church. What you just saw was just a handful of men who had a unique encounter with God at the Return Northwest. On behalf of our senior pastors, myself and our men's leadership team, we want to extend that invitation to you to partner with us in 2019. We are excited to tell you that our registration is now live, and so you can go to overcomercc.org 
get yourself registered. God bless you, and we'll see you next year. There's truly nothing like it. Many men have come to that event and said, I've been to something like this before. And I said, no, you haven't. You can't say that because it's a different location. It's different people. It's a different day. So you can't say that you've been to something like this before. God is doing a new thing, the scripture talks about. And we feel that we have found an avenue for men's hearts to get touched. And as Pastor was saying earlier, and the worship team was singing, chains are being broken. And that's what you heard from these men. And so I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at the website. If I could have Jeff Towery and Yaden and um, John, there's one more, Kaylin, if you guys could stand up. If you, if you have any questions about what... Uh, what it's like and getting registered. I want you to see these guys. John was the most recent that has come through. And as a matter of fact, John was one that said, I've been to something like this before. And I remember looking at him going, no, you haven't. Uh, but you can see any one of these guys if you have any questions, and they'll give you a little bit of information. Most of what you're going to hear is all will be revealed in due time. Okay, because we don't want to shift the experience that God has aligned for you. And I'll be here after service. Uh, but let's appreciate these guys for taking that, that step. <laughs> Pastor and I were having some discussion last night about what it's going to look like. We want to bring that event out here to the Northwest, and we want to be able to train the leaders here in the Northwest so you too can participate in a great move that I believe God is doing. And so there's, there's some things being written and, and discussed so that you guys can all be a part of it. Amen? Let's go ahead and move forward. I think I have about two hours left. Is that right, Pastor? Okay, great, great. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about the legacy you are leaving. Because everybody's leaving one. Everybody here is leaving a legacy. And if I were to ask how is it you are uh, living that will impact your family, your community, your social circle, your occupation, um, your church, your community. Um, I want you to just kind of reflect just for a few seconds and ask that question, how am I impacting those around me that they may say good things about me for as long as I've been on this earth? That's a legacy. You know, a lot of people plan on leaving different things, and I think they all apply, and we'll touch on some of them, and, but, but most important, we want to get an understanding of what is our children going to pick up on? What are they going to say about me when I'm gone? On my epitaph, when Jesus calls me home, I want it to be said about me, Jeff loved God to no end. And he didn't speak so much about it as he lived the lifestyle of one who loved God. And you might want to write that down. That was actually pretty good. <laughs> so let's just reflect just for a few seconds. How are you living how are you communicating that might impact, let's begin with, family. Then let's move to church. And when you step into the community, and then many tomorrow are going to clock in at work, thank you, Jesus. And what does the community see in you? Let's just reflect for a few seconds. I'll give you the, the jingle of I Think Jeopardy. <laughs> See, it's important that we really do take this serious, though, and, and just kind of look and reflect on how we live in the community. Not so much what we say, but how we live. 
You know, many of us are here today because we love God. Amen? If, if, you, if you're here because you love God, say amen. amen. But let's not be deceived in thinking that God is only here. See, because sometimes it's easy for us to put on our best, and I think that's important. And sometimes it's easy, I think, to come in and put on that Sunday morning smile, and I think that's important. And sometimes it's, it's, we come in and we say amen, and we shout, and we raise our hands, and we jump in worship, and that is important. But I would believe that it's more important if you are doing those things outside of the wall not just in the walls. In the walls is important. I'm not making light of that. But if it's a lifestyle of us living, loving God, then it should be evident in our life, not by what we say, but by how we live. Say, so grab your heart. Just go ahead and grab your heart. Say, Father, speak to me. So what is it that you are leaving as a legacy? Everyone is leaving something. Most just don't stop to evaluate and take a look at what it is that you are leaving. The healthy impact you have on your family will most likely be discussed for a lifetime and more. I don't know that I could say that for a negative impact that you might be leaving on your, in your family. How many of you have ever experienced, I know there's nobody here, and so don't think of your neighbor, but have you ever experienced someone negative? I don't know that an individual that takes a negative approach to life consistently will be talked about all that long. It might be brought in a discussion, but somebody that might impact your life in a positive way, say Jesus, Jesus. is talked about forever. We talk about Moses, we talk about Gideon, we talk about David, we talk about Esther, we talk about Ruth, we talk about, we talk about, we talk about. How many of you know that the scriptures are still being written? The scriptures are still being written and the new discussions are John, Lynn, Renee, Ruby, Norm, Teresa, Jim, Jeff, the scriptures are still being written. And so I gotta, have, I gotta take a look and say, what do I want communicated about my story? You ought to take a look at what you want to be communicated about your story, because we all have phenomenal stories. They're all different. And the Father wrote this story out long ago. How many of you know the Scripture says that He wrote it out long before you were in your mother's womb? How many of you also know that it says that God knows the plans that He has for you, speaking to Israel? Future and hope. Not for disaster or destruction. He wrote out a beautiful story for you. We just got to get to a place where we want to live that story. So many of us, we want to leave riches and wealth and possessions. And, and this is all good, but there's so much more. I'd hate to leave somebody riches that doesn't understand the righteous things of God. So if that's the case, I would hope that I could teach my children, my family, those closest to me about the richest things in Christ before the richest things of this world. Because then if they mature in Christ and they are then blessed with the riches of this world, then they'll find themselves being good stewards and advancing the kingdom with the resources that God has given them, opposed to taking those resources and keeping them for themselves. Riches are good, but there's more. Proverbs 22.1 in the King James Version says it like this. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. It's not the book of Jeff. It's the word of God. It doesn't mean that we don't 
not work and go out and prepare for our future. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying sometimes we get off course because we make the riches our priority and God by the wayside. Our reputation goes by the wayside. Our character goes by the wayside. That can't be who we are. Why? We're called to be the salt and the light. We, the believers, ought to esteem the reputation of self based on the image of Christ himself and let that reputation be chosen when people see you. Our name in the earth is so much more important than all the possessions we could ever gain here in this earth. So what if I asked you a question? Can we get in, in agreement with something today? How many of you want to get in agreement? Okay, six of you. Uh, the rest of you are dismissed. Have a good day. How many of you want to get in agreement with something? How many of you want to win the valley for Jesus Christ? Let me just tell you something. When everybody participates, I preach a whole lot better. How many of you want to win the valley for Jesus Christ? What if we, we stirred ourselves up today? And what if we got excited? And what if we had this desire to experience and see signs, miracles, and wonders? What if there's a, a stirring in all of us to completely dive in and get a better understanding of the Word of God? What if there was a hunger constantly as we experience today in praise and worship, that tangible touch through the Holy Spirit? How many of you want that on a consistent basis? There's nothing like it. I see the young lady over here dancing and twirling and spinning because she's experiencing the King by His Spirit. I love that. I love that. All glory be to him. He's doing a phenomenal work in this ministry. But do you know that you don't have to wait till Sunday morning to experience that? Imagine if we hungered for that all the time. Imagine when we're frustrated and we're going into the workplace on Monday morning, if, if there was just a, a shift just for a second and you said, Jesus, I want more of you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because often we go and we say things like, oh, I have to go to work today, opposed to I, I get to go to work today. Right. That's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You'll hear those from time to time when I'm speaking. Oh, and by the way, Lynn, you know, I love how, who's the, the pastor that's coming on the 19th? He didn't tell you that this was the only day that I could come to. I mean... <laughs> I about took the microphone off my head and just kind of grabbed my wife's hand and said, honey, let's go. This isn't going to work. <laughs> you guys should grab a friend and be here. It looks phenomenal. And, and I, I get the download. I get the YouTube channel uh, from Valley. And so I look forward to seeing what God's doing through this man. So we need to get to that place where we are hungry for righteous things and hungry for Jesus, hungry to, to hear the voice of God, hungry to see the signs and miracles, hungry. And when we get to experience these things, or maybe the Holy Spirit might give you a word that you're going to speak into someone's life, and next thing you know, they're weeping and they're crying and they're saying, how did you know? You got to remember not to make it about you. You got to make it about Jesus and the things that Jesus is doing in the earth. And I'm going to hope to show you some scriptures today that when you follow the instructions according to God's will, not your will, you will see the signs and wonders and you will walk with God. You'll encounter God. You'll see the miracles. You'll hear his voice. You'll feel his touch. How many of you want that? See, most people want to know what their purpose is in life. And that's good. I get it. Because you want to be able to feel like, like you're, you're giving and you're participating and, and, and we're doing all of those things. I think it's phenomenal. I love that desire. But, but I would hope today that we can just rechannel that thought and make it more about him than us. If we can make it more about his purpose than our purpose. Often... I tell congregations how my wife and I, when we do our devotions in the morning and, and from time to time, we'll remember to ask God, how can we cooperate with you today, opposed to asking him to cooperate with me today? 
Because he already, according to the prayer that Jesus is teaching the disciples, he already knows what we need. So forget tomorrow and live for today. And he knows what you need today. And so if he also says in that text that we aren't to worry about anything. It's difficult to do. In the times that we're living, the dark times that we're living, society's going crazy. It's difficult to do. But as we press into him, we stir up the hunger to see the signs and miracles, and we stir up the hunger to, to be in his presence and be touched by him. Then the worry seems to go away. How many of you feel great in this place? How many of you came in transparent before him, not me? How many of you came in with a little bit of a worry? But, you, but we come into this place, and his presence seems to make it all go away. If that's the case, why wouldn't we start our day and say, God, can I cooperate with you today? I don't think you're going to hear no. Which means you got to get ready. If you're going to ask the question, you got to be alert. You got to be focused. You got to watch. You got to listen. You got to stay tuned into what, what he is doing. Amen? So let's ask God, God, what is your purpose in this life today? God, what is your will today? Take off the, what is your will for me today? Because we're going to highlight some things that will point that out for you. You know, Jesus was the example always of what he was asking or commanding us to do. So everything that I'm saying, do you remember when he was in the garden? He wanted to redirect things for a moment. And he said, Father, let this cup pass by me. But then he said, but not my will. Your will be done. Well, let's paraphrase that. Let's not make it about me because you've already written this plan. And so how about I submit myself under that plan and do it your way? John talks about where we may decrease Help me, say it again. He will increase. We got to hold on to these scriptures. Too often we want things done our way. And often we seem to forget that the very way that we want things are the very things that Jesus said to deny. Didn't he? He said, deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow him. But often we ask God to do things for me. We ask God, what is my purpose in this life? Jesus is going, wait a minute. I said, deny yourself. Stop making it about you and make it about my Father in heaven. Because I lived that example for you that it's not about me either. It's about him. Is this helpful for anybody? In the scriptures, in John 5, 16 through 20, Jesus here is being harassed by the Jewish, Jewish leaders for healing. You know, they were on the, the porch called Beautiful, and there was the stirring of the water when the Holy Spirit would come, and then there was the layman that couldn't get himself to the water, and, and for whatever reason, he throws out that everybody passes by him as he's about to get in. And, and then we pick up in verse 16, Jesus, of course, healed him, and it was on the Sabbath, verse 16, it says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus replied, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Say, Jesus is working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Catch this. But what he sees his Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does exactly the way the Father does it. 
in like manner. Jesus didn't add anything. He didn't take anything away. You know what happens when we ask for the purpose for my life? We begin doing things our way, not his way. We start putting together formulas and plans and methods and principles and points and knit and knit and show up here and go here and do this and do that. And Jesus is on the throne going, where is this plan coming from, Dad? The plan has already been said. Many people want to hear the voice of God, but nobody takes the time to listen what he already wrote. The plan is there. What we have to do, who has their Bible? Hold your Bible up if you have your Bible today. I heard your pastor talk about this last week, so I'm just going to... You know where you're going if you ain't got your Bible in church today, don't you? Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. There was a time I think they used to preach that way. I mean, if you want to hear the voice of God. How many of you want to hear the voice of God? Can I ask you to get off Facebook and get your face in this book? Instagram, Facebook, what else is there? Okay, see, all of you that said so, I'm going to be praying for you. He's already spoken, thank you. Nice Bible. He's already spoken. So let's just get in the Word of God. Let's hear Him through His Word, His living Word. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows Him some things. Is that what it says? He shows him all things that he himself does, and he, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So Jesus in this text addresses his and the Father's continual movement in the kingdom of God, and that he will do nothing of his own accord, his own way, but only what he sees the Father do. If we can stop making God's plan about us, we begin to see things that only He sees Himself. Let me just give you an example of just the, the distractions and things that come our way. Teresa and I were at the Seahawks game a couple weeks back, and it was an outstanding game. They beat the Dallas Cowboys. Ushers, ushers, you see them. Move them out. It was a phenomenal experience. We woke up and we jumped on what they would call the Sounder train over there. We live south of the Puget Sound and Bonnie Lake out towards Enumclaw and Mount Rainier. And, and, uh, so, you know, it could take us potentially up to two, maybe more hours to get from our place to downtown Seattle. So we thought we'd hop on this train and we're on the train going to the game. We're like, this is awesome. You know, it, the train was going to get us from our place to downtown, to this, right to the stadium in 20 to 30 minutes. And so we get on the train and, and we're sitting on the table and we're, it's cool. We got a friend with us. We're having a good time. It's not crowded. We go and we absolutely enjoy the win that the Seahawks uh, did I say that again, or was I just thinking that? My wife's a Dallas fan, but I have the mic. And so it was a phenomenal game, and uh, after the game, you know, we're excited. Well, I'm excited, and, and, and I'm celebrating with all the other fans, and we get on the train, and this time the train is packed. And don't you know... There's a lot of people that are doing some things at the game like I used to do, but I no longer do. And so I'm on this train packed with a whole bunch of people that were doing some things 
that I used to do, but I no longer do. And, and so it's really super crowded. And, and, and Therese noticed that there was a, a section of people that were getting off the train. And so she looked and she said, hey, so I jumped up. And I, I knew where she was going with that. So I jumped up and I, I kind of looked. And right as I jumped up, there's this woman that slid in and she was sitting down in my chair. So now I'm like, I don't have a chair. That's okay, right? And the woman uh, sits down and... and uh, she looks, she says, well, were you sitting here? I'm like, yeah, I was sitting here. She starts to stand up. I'm like, no, you go ahead, you sit down. She says, thank you, I have lupus, and I'm in a lot of pain today. In that very moment, here's how distractions work. In that very moment, I hear a husband and wife who had been doing this at the game. And, and it wasn't that they were just drinking at the game, but it was the words, the vile and crude words that were coming out of their mouth. I mean, I can't even come close to trying to repeat some of the things that they were saying. And so I, I popped up and I turned and I looked and I know the countenance on my face was a countenance that I probably wore often when I was of the world. And I know this because I looked at my wife, and for years I hadn't heard her say, and she whispered at me, don't you get in a fight. <laughs> now, there's, there's young children, there's dads with their kids, Husbands with their spouse, and then all of a sudden we're experiencing this crude, 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 crude language on the train. Now, so Teresa and I, we get home, and I think maybe it was the next morning we're doing our devotions. And I said, you know, I really feel bad that I didn't pray for that woman on the train. And she responded, me too. The father wanted to reveal himself to this woman. And we allowed this distraction to pull us off course. And we were both convicted by the Holy Spirit that we missed it. Because we allowed what is going on in the world to steal this moment from encountering Jesus through me and my wife. All glory be to Jesus. So, so we said, you know what? We can still pray for her. And so we did. So why am I sharing all of this? To know our legacy, we're going to move quickly. We have to get to a place where we know God. And I'm going to give you just three quick deals here that I believe are helping me. You're going to have to consider them before the throne of God and see how it will play out in your life. But, but this works for me. And the first one is you have to know God. You have to know God. The only reason why we encountered things the way we encountered is because we desire to know more God intimately than just about God. So in other words, me and my wife, we're married. We've been married now for 31, almost 31 years. Come on, guys. And we're still getting to know each other. But over the years, I've learned a ton about my wife. And even in the recent struggles that have gone on, I'm continuing to really see the champion that she really is for Jesus. God chose her because I'd have wimped out. Yeah, go ahead. So what am I saying? We really have to kind of take time to, to know each other. I can only pray for Hattie emotionally because I'm getting to know Hattie. We're close like that. Go ahead. Is it Mike? Ronnie. Were you at the men's deal? No, okay. I'm getting to know John, you know. I, I wish we could spend more time together and 
and, uh, but we can't. But we got to be intentional, though, don't we? We got to shoot each other text messages from time just so we can stay in touch and we can communicate together. And of course, Jeff Towery is back there. Love Jeff Towery and, and, and all the guys, the Haruza family. We're starting to spend time and we're laughing and we're doing things. We can lounge together in uh, pajamas, slippers. I mean, hey, it's kind of cool. But everything that I'm saying ought to be the same way with Jesus. You have to make it intentional to get to know him more. See, we do a lot of things. We do um, Bible College, Supernatural School of Ministry. How many of you are part of that? I want to give props to it because I don't think they're just teaching you about Jesus. I think they're teaching you how to get to know Jesus. And so there's a lot of colleges and we applaud all of them. But they teach us about theology and they teach us about hermeneutics and they teach us about systematic theology and they teach us about Jesus. Uh, you know, I think all of it's great. My wife and I participated in Bible college, but there's something to be said about experiencing Jesus. And so Teresa and I had an experience years ago that radically shifted our lives. And, and let me just tell you, nobody can argue that experience with us. But everything that we're taught in the, the plans and the schools and this and that, we can always argue those points. And don't you know that there's people that want to argue with you about them? I choose not to waste my time because those arguments do nothing about what I experienced. They can't take that away from me. So we have to know God. John 17, 3 in the New Living Translation, you have Jesus praying here and he says, and this is the way to have eternal life. Say that with me. This is the way to have eternal life. Help me. What does it say? Well, stop. There's more than reading a textbook in getting to live in eternity with Jesus. Again, not the book of Jeff. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to the earth. A person can only get this through a relationship that you have to seek out on your own. I'd love to lead you to the water. And I hope that today that God would use me as so. But it is more than what you're receiving this morning. You have to go get to a place where you're getting in the carpet and desiring to have an encounter with the king. My addictions that I was bound by for 31 years, I was delivered of them because something shifted where I no longer desired the ways of this world and I wanted something different, but I didn't know what it was. But just because I wanted something different, Jesus said, I have what you need. And he touched me. And it radically shifted my life. Radically. But it came from a different desire in my heart. And now I just can't get enough. I want more Jesus, more Jesus, more Jesus, more Jesus. Yeah. Eternal life requires knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ. Let's stop just taking time to learn about him. And let's allocate the time to get to know him. Intimately. Amen? Amen. John 15, 5. Yes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let this be a constant desire that we're pressing in to know him more, that we're dwelling in him, that we're desiring more of his presence. Psalm 25, 1 through 10. David here is praying for defense and guidance and pardon, and it reads like this, Oh, Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts you will ever be disgraced. See, that's me. Amen. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. 
Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. I'm so thankful that he laid a path out for me when I was out. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness to all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. We're going to kind of start winding this thing down today, but that is absolutely a profound scripture that I would encourage you to stop and meditate on in your time. And just take highlight of some of the statements and the things that David was resorting to in a tough time in his life. Francis Chan writes, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that really don't matter. That video of those men, that's what matters to me. Having one's Being drawn to Jesus, that's what matters to me. Tyler? It is Tyler, right? Man. I love your heart, bro. Yeah, right. We give it all to him, but you listen and obey as I was just reading the scripture. I was just watching you up here. God hears you. God knows you. And continue giving him the glory. But it's okay sometimes just to say thank you. (laughs) I want to pray for you before you leave today. I was sitting here watching you, and I, I looked up, and I said to Dale, I said, what is this? who is this young man? I love your free spirit before him, man. I absolutely love it. I think our, the worship team here does a phenomenal job, but can we just appreciate what God's doing in Tyler right now? I don't even know you, man, but it's big, and it's got me moved right now in the spirit. So thank you for being transparent with your love for Jesus Christ. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, in this text we see that Jesus is performing miracles and religious rulers um, are challenging what they see. And then in verse 35 it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness, say every sickness, and every disease among the people. Verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send the harvest to send out laborers into his field. We see Jesus here living what I would see to be the designed purpose of God. He lives it out and it's an example. Example for what? For his disciples. And for us. So what's the assignment? Teach, preach the kingdom of God. And heal the sick. So he showed the disciples their, their assignment. We have to know our assignment and stick to our assignment. That would be point number two. You've got to know your assignment. To leave an outstanding, great spiritual legacy, you have to know what the assignment looks like. 
Otherwise, we're running to and fro, and we really are, are kind of getting caught up in all the busyness and all the craziness, and, and it's just really unfortunate. But come on, let's just stick to the assignment. It's already been written. It's already been said. It's already been exampled for us. So in Luke 9, 1 through 6, now we see one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples. Who did he call? And gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all, all diseases. What did he give them? Power and authority. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What did he send them out to do? Tell everybody about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. And if the town refuses you, refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So they began their circuit of villages. Doing what? we could just grab hold of the assignment that Jesus gave the disciples. It's going to call for a whole lot of grace and faith that when you leave here today, you too have been called on assignment. Can I give you a couple more scriptures that shows how this played out? So he called disciples, pupils, learners, students. And they sat before him humbly and received. And in that transition, now he's sending them out as apostles, pioneers, ones who go out and they, they make things big. And now in Acts 2 and 43, we see a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miracle signs and wonder. What did they perform? Do you know where that came from? In the early portion of chapter 2, there was an outstanding sermon preached. And because of that sermon and the good news that was spoken and, and Peter's fiery way of preaching, it says that some 3,000 men, not including all the women and children, but 3,000 men were saved and added to the church that day. Let me just tell you something. If we just had three or four fiery people that were ready to go out into the community and preach by the Holy Spirit's prompting. I wonder what could take place in the valley. Somebody say revival. Now let me encourage you. Revival doesn't come by all of us coming in unity in here and saying, Revival! It comes by young ones and old ones coming together and say, We've been assigned. He chose us and he assigned us to do what? Teach, preach the kingdom of God. Heal the sick. Now let me show you something else. We're winding down. Trust me. I think I have another hour anyway. So, Acts 3, 1 through 11. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer. As they approached the temple, a lame man from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the gate, the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate. So he could beg from the people going into the temple. Now, it's an interesting teaching and study here as to why they put him on the gate. The Jewish people had traditions that they needed to fulfill. And so if there was one begging, then they could come up and do their duty and put some money in his cup. But watch this. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Man, I tell you, there's something to be said when you know your assignment and you just follow the assignment that you were given. 
Because here we see a repeat of what Jesus taught them how to do. He said, don't take the resources with you. Take nothing. Take everything or nothing that would cause you to draw back to make things easy for you or comfortable for you or things that might steal your faith in me. He says, take nothing with you. So now we see that these guys are actually in action. They were students as all of us are when we're receiving the word. And then they were empowered to go and get some things done. And they didn't go into the community and say, well, you know, Jesus was cool, but it's a new time we're living now. And I think we should do it this way. He looked at the man and he said, silver and gold I do not have. But I've been given power and authority. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, Stand up and walk. Wow. That just fires me up at just the, the idea, the, the obedience, the willing spirit to do what God is asking him to do. And that's go and just leave everything behind. No comforts. Boy, we have it easy today in the Western church. And you know, that easy that we resort to, as Pastor Gordon would call it, we, we seek comfort and ease. When we're in a hard time, you know, we've got it good here. Let me just pull financial analogy. We run into a hard spot, we can resort to a credit card. When really we ought to let God show us and reveal himself in that hard spot and believe with faith that he's going to show up and show off. Teresa and I always say, we have a in a nick of time God. And he always shows up in a nick of time. Doesn't matter. And do you know how, why we can stand on that? Because he showed up when we were broken and bound by addiction. Lastly, you have to know his voice. 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 You have to, have to, have to, have to, have to know his voice. There's this epidemic in our society today of people wanting to hear the sound of their own voice. Constantly talking. Constantly trying to prove a point constantly trying to be smarter and have the answers talking over each other you know if you're talking over someone you're really not trying to listen to somebody you're not trying to get their point of view you're not trying to get their look we see it in the political arena we see it in our offices on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday and unfortunately we see it in the church Everybody's trying to prove a point. How many of you want to please God? You got to listen. You got to get comfortable with knowing his voice. The Apostle James, half-brother of Jesus, said, be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. It works. Man, I wish we had about 45 more minutes. I just want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? How many of you want to hear his voice? If you want to hear his voice, stand to your feet. You know, there's something to be said. For an impartation. There's something to be said when somebody has been radically delivered, they find themselves trusting in a deliverance ministry. And out of that experience, then 
Let me just talk about myself. My spirit, I am absolutely stirred up and passionate for the things of God, so much so that I desire to see him move. And because I desire to see him move, I press in to know him more and more every day. And I, as I mentioned earlier, my wife and I, we try to get an agreement with God. Can we cooperate with you today? So in other words, I don't go about the day to live my, way, my life my way. I want to live my life his way. And this is who we are. I'm not kidding you. And, and we were, that's why we were so frustrated when we missed that opportunity on the train. But in order to live my life his way, I have to listen for his voice. His voice. His voice. And only his voice. So the worship team is going to sing behind us. And Pastor Lynn, if you have prayer warriors and our guys that have been through the return, if I may ask that they come forward and let's pray for God's people. And if you can't make your way up here and you would like prayer, wave your hand and we'll come to you. Thank you, brother. So as our team begins to to sing in the back. Let me just pray a blessing over you. And then uh, John, come on up here. Jeff, come on up here. Yaden, where's Kaylin? Hey, there's something to be said for getting out of your row in faith that this is a moment God saw before you were in your mother's womb. And transition is here for the taking for you. So as I'm going to come down here and ask my wife to join me down front, and as the worship team sings, let's pray for one another. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you by your grace, by your love. You, Father, will touch the hearts of your people today and that they would move only by your spirit today, knowing that from this day forward, their life in the home, their life in the church, their life in the community and the nations will be different. And because it's different, you will leave the legacy that you've always desired to leave, Lord, through their lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.